I'm content with this time that you've been studying that. That you've given me the story, Lord God, and I pray that that I just be studying this today. I'm content with this time that you've been studying this. I'm content with this time that you've been studying this. I'm content with this time So uh, right now we're going to call the uh, Dr. Warren Five Mockers. If you are visiting, you've heard this before, you're uh, how obligated to be able to be guests, enjoy uh, the privilege of being here, saturated with the Holy Spirit. As that's what we uh, reserve the money for sure, and that's the uh, right thing. So, uh, let's see. Just gonna read it. Oh, oh, here we go. The Bible is going to be on the song. <laughs>
that Jesus said, until this is done, he does not come back. That's why it's so important that we need to understand what the gospel is, because that's what we need to be teaching and sharing and talking about in the coffee shop. Wouldn't it be great if you could go into every coffee shop and hear people talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Instead of, oh, well, what are we going to do about this leadership candidate? What are we going to do about this guy? Or is this world going to come to an end? Or are things that are happening over here or happening over there? But just getting into the coffee shop and saying, I want to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus with you today. Because that's what changes lives. And so why I ask Olinda, you know, you have a great children's ministry here at the church. And the last year we have had a burden to, uh, to reach out to the children that are in, find themselves in war. You know, the last time we were here, it was a couple years ago, and and uh, at that time, the Myanmar Tekken people were still at war with the Burmese Buddhist people, and now it's been going on for five years. There's over 120 to 25,000 people in IDP camps, which is internally displaced camps. There has been over 140 or so villages destroyed, over almost 100 churches destroyed, and people have fled up into the mountains. And they've gathered together. Can you imagine? When your church is destroyed, your pastor, your leadership, and everybody is fleeing in the mountains. And all of a sudden, now you have a new church in the mountains. But what is happening is that the majority of these people that are up in the mountains, there's about, as I say, about 120,000 of them. Well, probably most of them don't have, uh, if you would look for young people, they're not there. If you're looking for dads, they're not there. But most of the people that are in these camps are children. And also the moms and dad or the moms and the grandparents. And so what is needed now is because they're having the tools, remember I told you God is doing miracles around the world. And we talked last week about another miracle that took place in the country of India where God's Holy Spirit moved and touched people's lives. Well, there's another work of the Holy Spirit, uh, plus many other ones, but this is another specific testimony I want to give. About how the children, which is about 50 to 60,000 of these people in camps, are trying to get schooling and education and are trying to still learn about Jesus Christ, are trying to still learn about their language, and they don't have enough teachers and things like that. So, what is happening? The Holy Spirit, again, praise God, the Holy Spirit is raising up the whole church Christian in China to come walking through the mountains to teach the children who are kept in. Can you imagine that? We always think of China in such a negative way. But God is doing a powerful work in China. And out of that powerful work, out of the moving by the Holy Spirit, that the, the young men and women are sneaking across the border and are coming into the Kechen state, into the mountains of that, to be able to teach the children not only uh, uh, courses that you would need for learning in school, but also about Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing? Let's give God a, a clap off. And so this year we, we decided to try to get them some resources. And I'm going to get Cole in to share in a minute, but we, we just did, uh, we're doing four books for the children. One is called uh, Matthew, and uh, we, we believe in the power of the word, so we set it all up so that the children can use us as a textbook to learn their language. They have the book of Matthew. There is a Lord's Prayer and how to become a Christian and everything in the back. We put false references and everything in it. We put that together for them. And then we also put together, called when it worked on it, uh, catechism and also uh, teaching and, and ministry type things for children in this book. So a catechism is simply a question and answer. It's got pictures and teaches the children many different things about the Bible. Then we also have a testimony. Uh, Booker T. Washington. And it's interesting, Booker T. Washington, of course, is a, a black man from the uh, United States, or the United States. But the reason why his testimony is so powerful is the Kechen, because as culturally they suffered as black people in the United States, and went through very many struggles and heartache, but this man, when, even though he had all, all these trials and persecutions and, and things that came upon his life, he was able to rise up above that and through the power of God be able to become uh, uh, a leader in his community. 
And so it's exciting about that. Well, that's the third children's book. And the last one we're finishing is the, the 18 Old Testament children's story. So we're going to wrap these all up in class week and be able to try to hand them out to all the children. Now, it might be interesting, but uh, this will be the first time that we'll ever have textbooks. So they'll use this. The whole denomination is going to, we're going to get them ready by November. And in December, they're printing them over there. And then they're going to train their leaders over there. We're going to train the churches, and they're going to go off with all the IPP camps. So, but we need your help. If you want to get involved in this, uh, this kind of ministry for the children, uh, it's going to cost us about thirty thousand Canadian dollars, but which is not a lot. But unfortunately, our Canadian dollar is worth a lot over there in court. So we have to go through uh, the process of exchange. But this is what we're praying about, because we want, we believe in the power of the gospel. And not only do we believe in the power of the gospel, but we believe that the word of God can change people's hearts. Amen? And we need to get it into their hands. Sometimes it's not just the preaching, but it's also the resources. Sometimes it's uh, one guy, one day a man said to me, you know, you need to pray for resources. And I said, why? Because resources can go where you cannot go. You know, sometimes people will, will, will take a book and they'll lay it on their coffee table or lay it on their house, and the person who actually took it will probably never read it sometimes. But sometimes a young person will pick it up at night. Sometimes a, a, a mom and dad from somewhere else will pick it up. I've been amazed at where the materials that we have written is where they end up going. And maybe that's why Gideon put Bibles in the hotel room. You know, we never know how many will ever open up that drawer and pull out the Gideon Bible to read it. But I know many of people who have pulled out the Gideon Bible have read it in their lives and changed. And so that's why we're trying to get them the book of Matthew, so we still have a piece of scripture that they can open up. And I'm going to encourage the pastor to preach through this in the mountain churches. But to take a whole year to preach through the book of Matthew so that people can have at least a portion of scripture. I know many of us have got a number of Bibles, but uh, they don't have any. And so we've been taking the time to get it ready. So Colin, why don't you take a moment to uh, share a little bit. Let's see if we can turn this on. Get it off or whatever. I think you just got to hold it in. And the old green light comes on. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I want to say thank you because uh, this church has always uh, praying for the country of Myanmar and also always praying for the ministry of Christ. As uh, James shared about the IDP, we still have a war, not finished yet. But this November 8th, uh, country of Myanmar will have an election again. Hopefully, after that, we will have a little bit better situation. But um, everybody knows that the military is controlling the country and they are running for the country. So, 2010, when we did mention the military and the army, people are running the and then they win. And last five years they control the control of the country. So hopefully this high connection will be a little bit better and changed. But we all care for that. And I want to do a request that this will be for the country of Myanmar and this coming election. And also we will be going back in November 16th to Thailand and Myanmar. So in Christmas time we will be with the IDP people and at the camp we will be with the children and ministering with them. So please continue to pray for our safety. Not for me that much because I'm from there. But it is different color than us. So always the goodness and so there will be want to check why it is there. Continue to pray for the Christian in Myanmar, not only with the Christian people, we have suffering and difficulty. A lot of ethnic people, they are all Christian, so the majority of the Buddhist army people, they want to destroy all the Christian people. Thank you for all of you coming and we continue to pray for the country of Myanmar and the Christian there and also for the Buddhist. 
Well, in Monica, we took Dr. Angler and Monica took the first of the district. You know, they have given a lot of money for the government. I think it's the appropriate thing to do. There's a great one for the government. On behalf of the district. So, I don't let her know that I'm a case of technique.
about this good news, so that Jesus Christ was the good news. And so like as we talk about the good news is not dead, now that we begin to need to talk about how the good news is going to bring challenges in the last day. It's like we're going to go from part one to part two today. Because if you're going to be proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, you're going to face some challenges. Because people do not want to hear the good news of Jesus Christ because the good news of Jesus Christ demands change. Change from living the way of the world to living the way of Jesus Christ. It demands change. And if you watch what the enemy is doing, he is attacking all these nine points one way or another. He's developing cults and churches that don't believe in these nine points anymore. Now, if you remember, as we began to look at the scriptures, we want to now continue on into Mark chapter 10. Because as we move into the second part of the message, and how the gospel challenges us in the last days, because I believe what's going to happen in the last days, and I will, I will prophesy this today, that there's going to be a, a renewal, a revival back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because we get back to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're going to see miracles and deliverances and healings like never before. But the reason we've got to, we've uh, fallen away from miracles and healings and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all these things because we began to put our trust into other things. And that's become the problem. We trust the things of the world more than we trust the Word of God. And there's a time coming where you're going to have to make a decision like those eight people down on the stage where they had to stand up and say, yes, I'm a Christian, and the guy took a gun to their head and killed them instantly. The gospel is not going to be something that's mediocre and in between. You either are with the gospel or you're not with the gospel. There's going to be a dividing line. Matthew 25 talks about the dividing line between the sheep and the goat. It's coming, people. It's coming. And in Mark chapter 10, verse 29, Mark continues to speak about this gospel. Let me read it to you. So Jesus answered and said, And surely I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or father or mother or wife or children of the land for my sake and the gospels. Who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time? Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. The many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Mark was trying to, or by, led by the Holy Spirit, to write this down, that there's going to be challenges that are going to come because of the gospel. And he's going to say that even the gospel is going to cause problems in your very home. It's going to cause problems because if you take a stand for the gospel, your children may not like it. Your teenagers may not like it because it goes against the things of this world. And sometimes it's difficult to be able to stand up, but I believe in the gospel no matter if it causes my children to go one way or causes my family members to go another way. We are going to stand firm on the gospel. No matter what the cost is, can you say amen to that? Because that's what's coming to you. We are entering into the most exciting time but it's also the most difficult time. We're entering into the last days, I believe, and I will stand here and prophesy that. And if it doesn't happen, you have the freedom to stone me, okay? That's what the Old Testament says. Well, I believe we're into a dynamic, exciting time. Things are changing rapidly, and as people are going to need to stand up for the sake of the gospel, and it's going to cause division, it's going to cause all kinds of problems. But we need to stand up. He goes over in Mark chapter 13. Again, and he talks a little bit about the gospel. Of Mark 13, verses 10 to 13. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry before, beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever you have given, you in that hour speak back. For it is not you who speaks, but the Holy Spirit. Now brother, now brother will betray brother to death, and a father to his children, child. And his children will rise up against his parents, 
and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now a lot of times we like to preach that first two verses. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. But we don't realize that when we preach the gospel, there's going to be challenges. There's people from Myanmar that don't like me. For two years I couldn't travel to Myanmar because many of the Christians figured I would be martyred. And it was a difficult thing for me to stay back in Thailand. Because they know over there, at least in their mind, every time you see a white person, you're automatically a Christian. Which is, of course, not true in North America. But there's things that are going to happen that people are going to turn. And the gospel must be preached to all nations. And so it needs to go out. But the gospel of to preach to all nations, as you, you may not realize, but all the nations are coming to us. Our Prime Minister of the Elect said yesterday he's going to bring in 25,000 Assyrians by the end of this year. The nation is coming to us. The peoples are coming to us. They are all around us. And so we don't have to just have missionaries go to the other side of the world. We need missionaries in our church. And a missionary is a proclaimer of the good news of Jesus Christ. And whether we like it or not, we're all called to be missionaries. Did you know that? You can't get out of it. Are you, you don't seem very excited about that today. But it's the truth. If you're a called one of Jesus Christ, you are automatically the disciple of Christ to be the one to fulfill the great commission. Commission. Did you hear it? Commission. To go out and make disciples. And they are people that are going to be all around us. People say, I can't go to the mission field. You don't have to worry about that anymore. They're coming to you. I go to many churches that there is probably more people from other cultures in the church than there is of my culture. That's what's happening in big cities nowadays. They're coming. And they're, they're coming because God is trying to bring them. We won't go to them. They will come to us. Because God is doing something in the last day to show His grace and mercy to all nations, to, to all people. And if we will not go to them, He will bring them to us so that we can proclaim to them the good news of Jesus Christ. Isn't that exciting? But that's our job. That's our ministry. That's what we're called to do by the Holy Spirit. So anyone sitting beside us or sitting around us or in our churches or in our schools, guess what? Your ministry, people ask me, what is my ministry? It's not complicated, people. It's not complicated at all. Your ministry is just to be a witness of the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? But for some reason, that becomes the most difficult thing. But that's what the gospel is all about, is that we need to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And then there's going to be challenges, but the Holy Spirit will direct us during those challenges. That's why we needed an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our churches like never before. I know we always talk about the 80s and the 90s, how the Holy Spirit moved, and how the Holy Spirit did this, and how the Holy Spirit, we keep talking in the past. But is the Holy Spirit going to do something amazing in the last days? And the answer is yes. It's going to be more amazing than the previous days. But we've got to get in tune to that. Other parts of the world are already getting in tune to it, but we are not. And the sad part of it is we're going to be betrayed. There's going to be betrayal. There's going to be challenges. It's already happening in other parts of the world. Where the Spirit of God is being out for it, but at the same time, family members and friends and that are, are taking sides and there's beginning to be hostility and all kinds of persecution against Christians around the world like never before. As I said last week, a Christian dies every five minutes. is martyred every five minutes. That's an amazing thought. But it is happening. Why? Because they have chosen the gospel. And the enemy wants to come against the gospel. So the gospel for the gospel truth for today is, is what goes on after what we talked about last week. Last week we talked about how Jesus was born of a virgin. How he lived here on earth. How he died on a cross. How he was resurrected from the dead. And then how he ascended on high. 
And a lot of people feel that's the end of the gospel. But that's not the end. And the gospel did not stop at the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The gospel is alive and well on planet Earth today. And it's still going forward. It's still, the gospel is living. Why? Because Jesus Christ is still alive. He is. One of his names is the gospel. He has not died. But the enemy is trying to destroy his birds and birth story. Trying to destroy that he lived here on earth. Trying to destroy that he really didn't die. Trying to destroy that he didn't really arise from the dead. Trying to destroy that he did not ascend into heaven. Satan is trying to, to destroy every one of these first five things, but it doesn't stop there. And this is what we need to remind Satan of, that the gospel doesn't stop there. Because what is the next step of the gospel after Jesus ascended into heaven? The next step of the gospel is that he poured out his Holy Spirit as he prophesied he would do. The good news didn't stop after his ascension and say, well, now we're just waiting. No. The next step of the good news is that he poured out his Spirit upon all who would receive him. I go to my Father, my Father will send you one, the Comforter, the Teacher. The Gospel has to stop because the Holy Spirit is there to comfort us and to teach us and to use us and to flow through us with his power and his anointing. Can you get excited about that? Just as Joel 2, 28 says, that in the last days, he will pour out his spirit. We're in the last days. The gospel didn't quit. It's still alive. Well, we got the first two rows going. You're lucky there's a platform here, because I normally don't like being up here. I like being glad I can get my hands on people and touch you're not getting the anointing yet? I'm going to give it to you right now. But you're lucky that there's a divide between me and me. At this moment, my brother says he's happy to I'm glad. But the gospel was poured out to the Holy Spirit. And that's good news. You know why we had the great revivals in the 80s and that? You know why? Because people kept going to coffee shops and that. And yes, it was crude. And yes, it was hard. And people used to walk up to one another and say, Are you filled with the Holy Spirit yet? Do you remember those old days? Some of you don't even know about them. But they were old days. Do you remember that? Some of you ever experienced that? You used to annoy me sometimes. The first thing that would happen, they wouldn't ask you, Are you saved? You know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. The first thing they would ask, have you been fulfilled with the Holy Spirit? And some of you got pretty annoyed with that. Anyone got annoyed with that? If you did, okay. A few others? A few more honest people? Thank you. I did. But it was important. But the good news is to stop their people. Not only did the Holy Spirit come, but the next part of the good news, number seven, as he birthed forth his church. Whether you like it or not, <laughs> you're part of the good news. He birthed you forth to be his body, to carry his fruit, to manifest his gifts to a world. Does that excite you or not? It excites me. But it puts a lot of pressure on it, doesn't it? Well, then I'll have to start living as a Christian again. I'll have to start walking in the Lord. I have to start giving up some of my stuff and my way. You know, that's not fair. I, I worked hard all my life. I deserve what I got. I deserve what I want. And blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay. But it ain't going to work with me. Because the gospel is flowing. Keeps flowing. It flows by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ has limited himself to the sad. But he has limited himself to work through us. You know what I'm saying? Because we have become his body, we become his hands, we become his feet. We are the ones of his voice. The scriptures we just read that don't worry when they start to imprison you and to take a whore of you because I'll even put the words in your mouth so that you know, will know what to speak. And when you speak it, you won't even know where that came from. 
That's how powerful the gospel is. The gospel, the good news of the church is that he sent forth his Holy Spirit and that he pours forth a church. That he's coming without spot or wrinkle washed in the blood of the Lamb. A church that was going to become his bride. I don't know if I've shared this vision with you before. If I have, then we can go to sleep at this moment. But if you haven't, I want you to hear it right now. I had a vision a while back where I saw a platform just like this. And in the platform, there was the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit was hovering over. And uh, some of the tribes of Israel were on that side, and the 12 tribes, and the, some of the other side. And they were all mingling and talking. And the rapture had just taken place. And people were coming in from the road, the spot to the gates coming into the gates into heaven. And everybody was talking and, and cheering and getting excited. First of all, you know why people were so excited on the day of the rapture? Because they were looking around, amazed to see who was there and who wasn't. And a lot of them were excited because they just thanked the Lord that they got there. Praise God. I bet. Because some of you wondering if you were going to be there, right? And so there was a lot of talking and communication going on and everything. And Jesus was talking to the Father the Shekinah glory was over, and there was a pulpit, like a kind of a platform, a little bit like this. And just at that moment, as the people, the final people were coming in, Jesus stands. And he walks up to the edge of the platform. And he turns to his father. He looks at the people. And he turns to the father and he says, Father, for the very first time today, I want to introduce you to my God. Well, the people went nuts. We were cheering and screaming and yelling, hallelujah, because now the bride was ready and was now. And the platform opened up right in the middle. And there was Father on the one side and Jesus on the other side. The Holy Spirit was hovering over. And as the platform opened up, behind it was the very supper of the Lamb. And you talk about excitement. We were walking all in. Praise the God. Hallelujah. I mean, we couldn't stop talking for, and shouting for like two months. But that's what's coming, people. That's what the church is all about. The gospel of the church of Jesus Christ has not stopped yet. It's the good news. Don't put the church down. It won't be perfect. It won't meet all your needs. But it is something that God has ordained to work through. Whether you like it or not. There's going to be people sitting around you that you will not like. And they probably won't like you. But because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, our lives can be changed, and we can have fellowship one with another. But that's not the end of the good news. There's something more coming in. Do you think, we always think that the good news has come to an end after that ascended. No, the Holy Spirit was sent. Secondly, the church was birthed. But you know what another part of the good news is? Let me see if you can figure this out. Soon as Mary we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the king. Did you get it, people? The good news has to stop yet because the good news is getting ready to come in the clouds with a trumpet of the sound of the Lord. People, we got to get out there and tell people in the restaurants and the highways and byways that the good news is not over. It's still being fulfilled. It's still happening. It's still taking place in our very midst. And then in a few days or a few months or a few years, if the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and times will be no more. And that we will be taking up those who have faith and belief in Jesus Christ, even though the looks of the challenges that we're going to face. And there will be lots of challenges. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that under the altar, that the blood of the martyr will flow out. Oh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. But those who persevere to the end, praise God. I'm going to be one of those who persevere to the end. I don't care what the cost will be. But we need to get out there and just tell the people about the good news. The good news of Jesus Christ. That the kingdom, the second coming is going to enter into, or enter into us, or usher into us, the kingdom.
kingdom of God, a new heaven and a new earth. Are you excited about that? I remember Irene when she was dying. She had a slow death because of cancer is like that. It sometimes takes a long time for a person to pass away. But it was in the last few weeks that I believe that God was gracious enough for her to see the ninth point. And the ninth point of the good news of Jesus Christ is that there is a heaven. And I remember her laying there on her sick bed, and I was laying beside her on the bed. And all of a sudden, even though she was racked with pain and everything, she began to smile. I said, what's going on? She said, I can see heaven right now. And I said, what does it look like? She said, first of all, I see this beautiful mansion. It has got my name on the front. And as I walk into this mansion, it is so gorgeous. It's not a mansion that has 500 rooms, but it's like a couple little rooms, but they're just dedicated just for her. So she can spend time together with her Lord, with her friends, and whatever. And then she walked out through the back door, and there's a beautiful flower bed and pathways and everything that she could walk on. She said, Jim, you wouldn't believe how beautiful this flower smell and how gorgeous the streets are and the excitement of the people that are wandering around. See, you know, people, there's a, there's been a group of people throughout history that didn't even believe in the things that they have. You know, the Sadducees never believed in the heaven. The Pharisees did, but the Sadducees did, but what I do. I do believe in heaven because I've had visions of it several times. We are the uh, last part of the good news of Jesus Christ. There's a heaven for going. Does that excite you at all? You want to stay here on the board all these things? That's why Paul says, if it wasn't for your sake, I'd be up here. I had prayer requests like that. You know, there's lots of times I prayed, I want to die Lord. I'm sorry, that may be not encouraging. But I'd rather be up there than down here, ready for Paul. Any of you feel like that? Well, there's a lot of people, but you know Paul's prayer. But he says, but for the sake of those, we need to remain behind. So why? So many more can be brought into the kingdom of heaven. The reason why you are not there yet, because there's a job for you to do out here yet. Are you excited about that? People ask me, well, I don't know what there is for me to do for the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is there for me to do? There seems to be nothing. I'll tell you what to do. Just go out and help people about the good news of Jesus Christ. And I will tell you, not everyone will love them. What you say? But some will. You know, statistically, business people know that the reason why they hand out flyers, now I don't want to say that this is related to what we're doing today, but they know when they hand out a thousand flyers, 10% of them will be responsible. See, the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, I saw Mormons on their streets in Sinai. Did you know that? Because they know how to bring the false truth to our city, and they're going to try to lure people away into another gospel like Galatians says. Oh, they're polite and nice people said hello to me. I didn't feel like saying hello to them. I had something else in mind. It's my old nature sometimes. <laughs> Because I have problems with people that are propagating the demonic message of Jesus Christ and turning the truth into a lie. You see what I said? But I'll still love them because I hope they will be able to them. You know, one day I had something happen in America when I say, I talked about Mormons, I don't know if they love me or not, but I remember saying, wait, how do you do know Mormon? <laughs> One day I got a knock at the door of my house. There was an older man with his wife and his children. And I came down the set of stairs and I went down there and I opened the door. And they told me their name. And they told me said to me, he said, I'm an elder in the Mormon church, my wife and I. And my children are involved in the Mormon church. But we have been told that we can find an office. We come in and I read up to the Lord all of them that night. Isn't that a hard way to do it? That's what they do, But because his gospel is a lie, well, we 
anything going on here. Because when we look at this gospel, the last point, the gospel calls us to a response. Mark chapter 16. We've been going through Mark, but now we get to Mark chapter 16 and verses 15 to 18. And it says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Full stop. Period. And that's usually where the preaching ends. But the problem is, that's not the end of the Great Commission. That's not the end of the gospel. That's why I believe what I just shared earlier, something is going to change. Because I saw over in India that where people who were needing healing were healed. People who needed deliverance were delivered. Demons were cast out. All kinds of things were taking place. And the Holy Spirit said to me, it's coming to North America. Well, it happens a little bit here and there in a little trickle. But in the end, it's going to come predominantly. Because why? Because the gospel is going to go forth. Because the next two verses said, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. And they will speak with new tongues. And they will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will be by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick. And they will recover. So somehow, in my Bible, that's all in red. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that means it's all together as one thought. But a lot of times I want to proclaim the first two sentences and stand up and preach it boldly. But the last two verses I have problems with because it means I'm going to have to have more change. I'm going to have to change the way I live. I'm going to have to change the way I live and be ready to be a tool for God to deliver you know there's a spirit that's going across the country now called drugs and alcohol. Young people are being killed over and over and over. Because drugs is like a demonic activity. It destroys their youth. So we're called something to do. We're to go into all the world. We're to preach the gospel. We're to lead them to be and, and to be baptized people. And we're to save people, not condemn them. That's what we're called to do. And the result of doing that, Jesus said in verses 17 and 18, In my name, you will cast out demons, you will speak in new tongues. You will not be hurt by poison. They will lay hands on the sick, they will be healed. You know, one of the biggest ways to get rid of Christians in India is poison them. A couple times they were concerned. Many times they would not let them eat certain things or drink certain things. So someone else came to them because many Christians are being poisoned over there because they don't have a way of checking on how you die. So when you die, they just uh, uh, bury you or, or uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Cremate, right. So there's no time because they have no funeral home, things like that, the body for a week or a few things like that. So they just poison you. One pastor's friend of mine, his son was poisoned. Another time when we were there, and he died. Another time that, uh, the last time we were there, another pastor's son was poisoned. So that's a good way to get rid of people. But it was interesting that as we went into the services, we began to pray for him. He said to be healed, they were being healed. We began to pray for the Lord who needed to deliver from demons were delivered. We began to pray and lay hands on people that were going to the streets of tongues. And a new tongue that will glorify God. They were being killed. And I had talked to a deacon over here one time and I said, You know, this is what's happening on the other side of the world. He said, Deacon said, Does God still do that yet? Have you ever asked that question? Does God still do those? Well, that was a fad back in the 60s and 70s. We got through that now. We're all, of course, so much more mature. You ever heard that? Yeah, you need to thank the Lord I'm a Christian. Because <laughs> my God's still alive. The gospel doesn't let this stop. It's still being carried out. It's still being proclaimed. Praise God. Well, I want to close by reading Revelation 14. Because we pick up this word gospel one more time. Revelation 14.
Verse 6. So then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Even up until the last days, the gospel is still being poured out. And then even angels are the carriers. Isn't that amazing? God is not dead. He's alive. Oh, there's going to be challenges. There's going to be difficult times. But praise God, he's going to pour out the gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And those who will hear and see and make a decision to turn their lives over to the hands of Jesus Christ, he will come in and fill them. So today, people, my, my word to you is, are you willing to make a rededication to the gospel, to the full gospel of Jesus Christ? Not to part of the gospel, but to the full gospel. To say, yes, Lord, I'm back to the full gospel. Give it all to me. I'm back to all of it. I'm not going to pick and choose which part I like. I'm going to be, I'm here now as your vessel. Let your full gospel flow through me this day. Is that your commitment? How many people would raise up their hands and say, yeah, that's me? Amen. Amen. How about this side? Amen. We're going to pray that that happens today. If there's a need today that you need to be prayed for, something you need to be delivered some from, something you need to have some of the well, people at the bunch who are all to be healing. You know, we just believe that the full gospel today is still alive today as it was the first day in the book of Acts when the church of Jesus Christ was birthed forth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't we all stand up? Whatever you feel dead about to come and pray, if you just want to pray for a new commitment to the gospel, if you've slipped away, if you've lost your first love, the Bible says that in the last days, many people are going to lose their first love. Maybe that's all you need to do is say, Lord, here am I. I just need a refill of your, of your love again. I want to restore the first love that you poured into my heart maybe years ago, maybe even 10, 20 years ago, whatever it may be, or maybe there's some healing of deliverance, whatever. We're here as elders and leaders to pray for you today. We're not in a big hurry. We're just in a hurry to give you the gospel. Amen? God bless you as you begin to come forward.